and I think this is one that's become very near and dear to my heart, and that is the treatment of tricuspid valve and the treatment of that with the transcatheter respective, because this is really what most of us I think would call or say is the forgotten valve. And so um, here, again, we're conflicts of interest, and the question is, it's really a forgotten valve, and if you actually look in medical literature nowadays, I mean, it's amazing that idea that we can think that as much as we talk about aortic valve space and mitral valve space, there could really be any valve that is forgotten, but in reality, the tricuspid really, valve really is. And there's numerous articles that actually have come out on this lately. Not only that, if you actually go to Google and type in actually the forgotten valve, you're going to get about 1.1 hit, million hits, all regarding tricuspid valve and the idea there's actually a forgotten valve. So clearly, there's a re some things have been forgotten. Somebody has really been up and we've really not been taking care of this or really thinking my addressing this. And really, I think what validates this is looking at this figure. So if you look at kind of the, the 22 major players in the EU as well as the United States, there's over 8 million tricuspid patients believe out there. Now, not every one of these needs therapy, all these kind of things, but there's a large number in that cohort that we actually think need that. But of those ones, between both of these uh, areas, there's only been 23,000 annual tricuspid valve surgeries. So you're talking about one in only 300 patients with severe TR is actually getting something done to address that therapy. So the question is, why hasn't this valve been treated? Well, I think there's numerous reasons why that. I think Steve Bowling, if some of you may or may not know, has a very beautiful talk on the reason for not, lack of treatment for functional tricuspid valve disease. And I think there are many good reasons, all of which fit around this and saying they're not. The tricuspid valve is important. It greatly impacts our patients and many other reasons. But I think there's a few other things as well. One is we know that surgical outcomes in these cohort of patients are very, very poor. It's actually the highest morbidity and mortality of any patients in the STS registry. So because of that, I think surgeons have been really averse to trying to aggressively treat that. And because of that downstream, we just see these patients aren't even really thought of for treatments or referred for, and we really underappreciate their contribution to symptoms. And then let me remind you also, these symptoms don't only include right heart failure symptoms of typical low extreme edema. These patients do have shortness of breath and fatigue, as we've seen, and I'll show you some data on this later as well. Some of the other reasons are, though, because of those surgical outcomes, there's really been a lot, people haven't done anything, but there hasn't been any transcatheter options to try to push people to more minimally invasive approach. And otherwise, the other thing I think is they haven't been found. So we haven't been thinking again about treating them because there hasn't been a natural process or path of treating these patients in the past. So we've been fortunate to be on the forefront of kind of moving into trying to treat these patients. And there's been several really ideas around how to treat these. One is a coaptation device developed by Evers Life Sciences that really is like a, a, a hot dog that sits in the middle of the tricuspid valve and tries to help coapt, though I think some of the early data we've seen so far with that is not too encouraging. People have been putting valves in the IVC to do that. We really, again, have not seen the greatest results from that. But I think the most promising devices exist around the idea of trying to do a percutaneous aneoplasty to try to help these patients. <clears throat> Now, the first really and biggest player in this is the Trialine device uh, developed by Mitraline. And what this is based around is the surgical predicate, which is the K procedure. And what we, it's a very interesting procedure. So it's an extremely, extremely small pro footprint. And what we're doing actually is just putting two sutures in the, around the posterior portion of the annulus and cinching these together, essentially plicate that and actually have a bicuspidization of the tricuspid valve. And so that was kind of the impetus for starting to try to treat these patients. I'm going to show you a case now that is uh, from the um, early feasibility trial that we just completed here in the U.S., the first 15 patients. And it's actually the first structural early feasibility trial that was ever completed in the United States. And um, this is actually a very interesting 78-year-old female, uh, history of cabbage, renal disease, but has severe TR and class 3 symptoms. And was high risk, as most of these patients are, for surgical repair. And you can appreciate on her initial TTE, -E, -E, she clearly has moderate severe, at least a severe tricuspid regurgitation. So I have to tell you, I, we've done numerous transcatheter procedures revolving valves before. There is no transcatheter procedure that is so heavily dependent on the quality of your imaging to complete these procedures. So the way procedure starts is the tricuspid annulus actually fits for a large portion around the uh, right coronary artery. So in order to prepare and have ourselves some fluoroscopic landmarks, we actually place a marker wire down the right coronary artery to kind of provide us some guidance during that procedure. 
Now, the first step then is to get our first radio frequency wire across the, uh, close to the posterior septal aspect of the annulus. And the way this is done is we're actually going and moving back and forth between T imaging both 2D and 3D to understand where we are. And then the more critical part is when we get to the appropriate location, we have to get this catheter that you can see in the right that's shaped like a candy cane there right up under the leaflets in a right location so that when we go through the annulus, we're not getting what we say is too hingy or too much into the actual leaflet tissue, but deep enough into the native annulus that we're actually having something thick to grab on. But on the other hand, also not too deep, because it's too deep, you actually often run into the radiatorial wall, or when you try to plicate, that actually you have too much native tissue and it doesn't plicate as effectively. So here you can see our first pass through again the annulus. Now you can see that the next step here is that we actually have to snare that wire out. And I, I didn't tell you before, we actually do this through two 14 French IJ sheaths. The second sheath we go in now with the guiding catheter and actually snare that out. We externalize it and then we are confirming the depth. So here we have a mil two, about 2.2, 2 uh, centimeters uh, in distance. And uh, we're happy with that current depth. So based on that, we'll now go back in and deliver the pledge because we've only gotten a wire to rail these things across at first. And this is actually, you can see, appreciate in the bottom here is we're pushing that black piece up around there. That's the pledge going across from the right atrium into the RV uh, and across native annulus. And then we'll actually deploy that pledge as we're coming backwards here. And you can see that white dot there and the black dot right below those wires there coming together as we're actually forming uh, that pledge and cinching it down. So now we have a small pledge. Uh, uh, pledge it on both sides, it's cinched down together, so we have one portion of the annulus now contained. Now we have to move to the second portion of the annulus. So uh, now we're actually moving more anteriorly, uh, and we were targeting a distance in the initial study of about 2.4 to 2.8 um, um, centimeters. And you can see the, get a sense of what's going on there. It starts to get a lot of equipment in the uh, small space very quickly there. But we finally have identified a location we thought was appropriate distance. You can see the wire coming back out now, and we go back forth our snaring. Now, again, the critical part of this, and this is very abbreviated, is we really have to target that appropriate distance. So now we actually have to go to 3D and provide an adequate measurement where we actually want to see what a linear distance and then a more of a circular distance is to make sure we have an appropriate length between the initial pledge and where our actual wire is going through the second time. Now, the reason for this is because if you actually don't go far enough a distance, you don't get an effective plication. But if you actually go over 2.8 centimeters now, we know that these patients have a much higher propensity of actually having a pullout of that pledge. And so we have to get a happy distance between those things now. Just so I don't forget to mention you later, we now have gotten approval to do a second pledge, second whole entire plication. So we actually now do this once, and then we do this whole step all over a second time to get a much actually more substantial reduction in TR as well. So now that we're happy with that, we're going back, delivering our second uh, pledge here. And then what we do is we perform our plication. And you can see where we've come down now. We've actually cinched those two initial dots together. So here you can appreciate, and thanks for pointing out the laser, uh, that you can actually, um, we actually are now plicated. So we have the two initial, uh, each pledge here and here, plicated together. And you can appreciate that plication here. Uh, and now the cut. And so what we appreciate here is a very substantial reduction in this lady's tricuspid regurgitation uh, by this procedure being done. And here's actually her pre or prior TR, um, prior and post. Now this is, you know, this obviously is not a complete res resolution of all of her TR, but what we've learned is actually don't need that. Now that we actually have used two pledge system, uh, we actually see these patients have mu very minimal TR residually afterwards. Now, you know, we've been doing, did the first 15 in the US uh, now, uh, we've actually now completed our seventh already. And we just presented the initial early feasibility data in the U, uh, at TCT. And what we found is actually extremely safe procedure. So uh, implant success has been 15 out of 15. And the only adverse event in the first 15 cases was that one patient needed uh, interprocedural stenting of the right coronary because it was tented. And again, that's because we saw the trichasm but annulus runs right there along uh, the right coronary artery. So there is a small risk of something like that happening. And as we mentioned, we learned that that distance can be too long. So three patients actually had a pullout their initial pledges, but of those who didn't, there was really, they, they had a huge, remarkable improvement. So here's our reductions actually. So uh, a significant reduction in tricuspid of uh, annular diameter. Uh, the annular air, uh, annulus area is reduced. PISA was effectively reduced. 
quantitative ERA was reduced, and what we saw that actually there's a very uh, close to significant reduction in the TR volume as well. Uh, we saw there was actually no uh, negative impact on RV function, as there was some concern that you kind of shut off this pop-out valve, that you would actually see some of that. We saw nothing like that at all. And we saw actually a statistically significant improvement in forward flow uh, in these patients as well. But I think the most relevant factor to me was actually looking at their improvement in quality of lives. So, you know, the bigger one for these ones is the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure. And we saw actually a 62% improvement uh, in their Minnesota Living with Heart Failure score after that. So I think all these things are signs that there's a lot of hope in treating these patients with transcapture catheter options. And I think there's a lot of patients out there that need it. It's a matter of identifying and we get them to the place that actually can offer them these kind of therapies. So with that, um, that's all I have to say. I'd be happy to open up if there's any questions on any of these topics at all.